Father Aidan McGrath, born in Dublin, Drumcondra, and one of six children. Three of us became Columban fathers. In 1918, my eldest of the three, he joined the Columban fathers in uh, Galway at that time, in what was called Dalgan Park, and it is now in the new place in County Meath where we are looking out at the Hill of Tara, probably well known to many people. But I joined the Columbans then in 1923, and a third brother joined them in 1929. Now, in my early days, I was in Belvedere College. Actually, I played football with poor Kevin Barry and have lots of friends still alive who were at Belvedere College at that time. I loved the college. I wasn't brilliant by any means, but I did enjoy even the classes and the sport. Well, in 1929, I was ordained a priest in Galway, and in 1930, after about six months of ordination, I was sent with several other Columbia, young Columban fathers to China. That time it wasn't a plane, we took the ship and it took us six weeks. It wasn't all that pleasant a journey, but it, it was tolerable. And when I got to Haiyang, H-A-N-Y-A-N-G, it was the first diocese of the Columban fathers, and the bishop was Bishop Galvin, and Bishop Galvin was the co-founder with Father John Bloick of Maynooth, of the Columban Fathers, probably well known now, these two names. However, Bishop Galvin welcomed me to the diocese, and things were difficult enough. Beside that city, you had three cities, Tankau, well known today by the tourists who are pouring into it, three cities with two rivers, the Yangtze River and the Han River. You have Hankow, which was a very modern city, and you have Wutang, which is partly Chinese, and you had Hanyang, which was very old at that time. Well, the rivers overflowed in the summer after I got there in 1931, and I had 16 feet of water in my room. Obviously, it destroyed my books and destroyed my clothes. I didn't get into that room for six months. We had to go into the house in a boat, and that was the beginning of many incidents of this kind that would occur in my life in China. But the bishop was short of priests, and one day he called me. With, I didn't have very much Chinese at the time. He called me and he said, Aidan, I want you to go up to Chenjiang. It was about over a hundred miles north, but would take two or three days to get there. He said, you're the first priest to go there. Uh, I'm afraid there's no church, and I'm afraid there's no rectory, there's no house. I don't know what you'll do, but in God's name, go. And as far as I can see, Aidan, you never will have a church, and never have a house. I might say here, in parenthesis, that Bishop Galvin was so concerned about evangelization, and about the fact that these Chinese were not as privileged as we were and were not baptized, that that was the top priority. Houses were details. And I would always admire him for that attitude. Well, I took off for this little town, and it's a long story. I was there for 16 years as parish priest. Um, there was no first house I went to was a house rented on the street and I couldn't pay for that and I moved to another one I lived there a couple of years and then I moved in with a family into a bigger old it actually was a pickle factory and it had a wall around it which was good but it was because of the pickle factory and the grain that they needed to make these things Naturally, it was full of rats and so on. I didn't like that, but I got used to it. You get used to anything in China. The main thing about the family that I lived with was that they were superb. They were not Christian, but they were brought up on the philosophy of Confucius. That man is probably not well enough known. He was marvelous. 
He did not know of God, but he spoke about the heavens. There was something in the heavens that he couldn't understand, but that was ruling things. Now there was an old man in the house, delightful old man, very well learned in Chinese classics. There were three sons and three daughters-in-law and about twenty grandchildren and myself. And I was quite happy there. I had a small room, and very soon the old man, he picked up a catechism and he read it with great relish. And he said, Father, this is good. And after a while he asked for baptism. And of course the three sons followed suit, and I baptized their wives and I baptized the children and we were a Catholic home. And I lived there for 16 years. It's interesting that in these days when even the children are talking about abortion and contraception and condoms and the rest, this kind of talk I have never heard in that Chinese family. And they took it from Confucius who condemned abortion as an abominable crime, condemned contraception, and even masturbation. The things that are thrown around in our minds today, they condemned, and they were pagans. However, I had 25 missions there, and it, there was no electricity, there was no running water, there were no buses, there were no cars, I didn't even have a bicycle, so I walked. And the 25 missions would take me about two months to get round them. Three days in this little hut and three days in the next one and take half a day to walk to the next one. I had only a certain number of Catholics, although there were millions of people living around me. I would hear confessions and say mass and hear con uh, baptize and instruct and bless the graves and bless the marriages and so on and then move on. That was all I could do. But when I'd finished the 25, it was I'd come back to my own family where I was living, and it was nice to get back, I must say, and then I worked in the city here. But at the same time, I felt rather helpless. One priest amongst millions of people. The very thing that Bishop Galvin himself felt when he went out to China in 1911 and found he was one man amongst millions he would have to do something about it, and he came back to Ireland, talked to Father Bloick and the bishops of Ireland, and now we have St. Columban Society with priests all over the world. I felt the same way, that I was useless, or at least, at least of very little use. And I asked the bishop for a priest, another one, and he had none. I asked him for a sister who might open a clinic, and he said, I have none. And then, one day, Pope Pius XI was talking about Catholic action, and I decided to try my own Catholic action, and it was a terrible fiasco. In other words, I didn't know what I now know. I didn't know at that time anything about the Legion of Mary, didn't know anything about discipline, didn't know anything about the amount of prayer that they should have in their lives, and so on. It was disastrous, and I scolded those who were in it, and they very naturally took a sort of revenge on me and wrote a horrible letter about me and sent it to all the bishops in China. Naturally, I was against Catholic action, and I was against the lay people helping me. I said I would work as much as I could, and that was it. However, the bishop later came, didn't come, but he sent me a book, and he said, try that. And the name of the book was the Legion of Mary Handbook, and I had never heard of the Legion, even though I came from Dublin, was educated in Belvedere College, never heard of the marvelous things that were achieved in Dublin in the 1920s. So I, when I saw the book, I said, this is useless. But in those days, we used to obey the bishop, and if a bishop said something, you did it. And just to obey him, I said, I will call in a few men and we'll have a go at it. And when it fails, as I was quite sure it would, I would give him the book, give him the book back. Well, we said our rosary at midnight. I waited till midnight till everybody was in bed because already I had failed with one effort. So I didn't want anyone to know that I was trying this one. And we said the rosary and we did the reading and we followed all the rules in the book. And the president, he gave out the things that I had assigned, difficult, 
works of conversion and getting marriages fixed up and so on, things that I had failed in. And lo and behold, the next week, everything that they had been assigned to had been achieved. They were very excited in the fact that they did what the priest wasn't able to do. And it suddenly dawned on me when this happened week after week that God was trying to tell me that if you don't use the lay people, you will get nowhere. And so I started a women's group, and a group for boys, and a group for girls, and a group for the seven-year-old Chinese, hardly able to stand up, hardly able to genuflect. Seven to eleven, they were marvelous. And they looked after their own age group, and would toddle along on a Sunday with a child of their age holding their hand and bring them to Mass and through the catechism and bring them back to their mother. That kind of work would be enviable today if we could do it, and we don't do it. However, after that, when I had my legion going well and I was just supremely happy at what they could do, including going into the prisons, instructing and preparing the poor bandits that were caught and would be executed within the week. They prepared them, they baptized them, and I was a happy parish priest. Then 4,000 Japanese soldiers walked into the town after the rape of Nanking. And everybody in the town was terrified and they came to me for protection. And the, even the non-Catholic ministers of religion, they said, are you going to go, Father? I said, no, where would I go? I'm staying here. They said, we have wives and children, we have to go. And they went. So the night that the soldiers came in, I had actually 1,500 women and children in my compound. They had prepared and bought the food and bought the oil and bought the wood and everything was prepared by them. And I shared their meals. And what I was to do, I don't know. but. I just had to take it on chance. And the night that the Japanese entered, I went straight down to meet the general and he wouldn't see me. The interpreter wouldn't talk to me and I felt everything was lost. That those poor women hiding in my place would be destroyed. So I met by the greatest chance an ordinary Japanese soldier on the way home. He came to the house, he was friendly, and he was amazed at what he saw in front of him, these hundreds and hundreds of people. I brought him into my room, and I didn't know what I was to say or do. But he asked about Hollywood. He loved movies. And at that time, the great star was Loretta Young. And he said, did you ever hear of Loretta Young? I said, yes, she's a personal friend of mine. Well, if you saw his eyes, he got all excited. He was in love with her on the screen and that I had actually met her. And then he talked excitedly about her and about her plays. And after a while he sat down and he wrote a big, on a big sheet of paper two characters, and out of his back pocket he took a red seal and he stamped it. He said, Father, put that on the gate. And no soldier ever dared enter my compound with 1,500 women. And after six months of that protection, Things were normal and they were safe to go, but not before my five presidia of the Legion of Mary had converted everybody in that house. I was a happy pastor. And then the Japanese expelled me, expelled me for two and a half years. They didn't believe de Valera was sincere and that he was neutral. And after two and a half years, when de Valera refused to give the ports to Churchill for the Second World War, they knew we were neutral, and they let me back. And after two and a half years, I went back to what I would, be, would find as a dead parish, and no Legion of Mary, I found the parish running smoothly without me. It was humiliating, if you like, that I wasn't all that necessary when lay people were helping. They had baptized the children, instructed them, they'd witnessed the marriages, and they'd looked after the dying. It was a great awakening in me. Well, the next thing was the coming of the communists. 1948, 
Archbishop Ribéry, who had been in Dublin here as a secretary to the nunciature and then went to Africa and met Edel Quinn, the girl from Cork, who is now up for beatification. He met her and he said she had done far more than any priest or bishop, even though she was dying. And when he got to China in 1948, and he knew that by 1949 Mao Zedong and the Communists would be taken over China and that there would be no more permission for the Catholic Church to work, he said, if it worked for Idel, I want it now. He couldn't find the Legion of Mary in Shanghai, but somebody told him that I had a group up 700 miles away. He got my permission from my superior and brought me down to Shanghai and he said, Father, as fast as you can, you don't have much time, get started. He sent me into the famous university of the Madams of the Sacred Heart. Very sophisticated, the most beautiful university I have seen. And these girls from the wealthiest family in Shanghai, not the place you would normally start a legion group, they were on fire. And that first group burst into flame and the whole college was full of legion groups. I moved out to Hankow, central China, did the same. I went up to Beijing and the Furin University run by the SVD fathers. They gave me permission to talk to the students and the very thing, same thing happened there. The Legion of Mary burst into hundreds of groups. And within two years we had 2,000 groups of the Legion and Mao Zedong suddenly discovered that the church that he thought he had killed by closing the churches, taking the hospitals, taking the universities, and kicking out all the Buddhists from their monks, and from their monasteries, he thought the church was dead also. And then he found the reports told him that it was alive. He sent out, search, sent out people to search and found, amongst other organizations, but the most effective, the Legion of Mary. And he called it and paid it the greatest compliment ever paid to it, he called it public enemy number one. He said, we're not afraid of America with the atomic bomb. They can kill millions of our people. We don't care. We're plenty more. But I will not tolerate people preaching Jesus and Mary. Evangelization. To me, the greatest force in evangelizing today, the Legion of Mary. Well, he arrested me. I was the one who started it. I was two years and eight months in solitary confinement, the tiniest little cell you could think of. No table, no chair, no bed. I sat on the floor for three years. You weren't allowed to talk, you weren't allowed to cough, you weren't allowed to sneeze. You were never allowed to close your eyes in the daytime. And if you were caught, you were punished, and I was punished constantly. The early weeks of interrogation during the night were impossible. And then the next day you were expected to remain awake all day. They did it deliberately to punish you. Now, and when I'm speaking to boys and girls in the schools, they get frightened at that thought of isolation. Sitting on the floor, nothing to read, nothing to do, two miserable meals, one at nine and one at three, and two cups of water, that's all. And some of the boys asked me, Father, did you not go mad? And I said, that's a good question. They went mad all around me. Poor fellows that never heard of God, never heard of the Blessed Mother, never heard of a reward in heaven. They just screamed their heads off. It frightened me at first, but then the doctrine that is promoted by the Legion of Mary, St. Louis, Maria Grignon de Montfort, to Jesus through the Mother, where you promise that you will never be disturbed or never worried in anything because of her protection. I sat on the floor and I was perfectly happy. I was there for two years and eight months and I say this here and I promised if I ever got out of the prison that I would keep saying it, namely that if ever I got out that I would talk about the Bonford because I found absolute peace of mind. The one thing that I would say we need in America, we need in Europe, we need in Ireland. We are a disturbed people, mentally, far more than before. De Montfort gave me peace of mind. And Pope John Paul II, when I went in 1980 to Rome and he called me up to say Mass with me, 
And after the mass, he came out and he said, Father, what kept you sane in prison? I said, I have no doubt. De Montfort's true devotion to Jesus through Mary. And he said, Father, do you know, it kept me sane in Poland while I was running from the communists. And so, you might say, what happened to your other legionaries? We have no figures. <coughs> we have no figures. But my president, the president of the Senatus of Shanghai, was arrested one month after me and they executed him. A young father of five lovely children. My vice president, a famous doctor, head of the biggest hospital in Shanghai and lecturer at the university, he was arrested one month after me and they gave him 30 years. He is now released and in California and he is a little old man with cataracts on his eyes. For the rest, we don't know how many were executed. We do know thousands were put in prison for 10, 20, and 30 years. You have to talk to these people. They won't write about it. Why? Because they know if they write about it, their friends and relatives in China will suffer the consequences. So this marvelous story of the resistance of the church in China to that terrible persecution, what Pius XII called the greatest persecution in the history of the Catholic Church, still kept the church going. We know today, when we were there in China, we had three million Catholics. Today, they say there are about 10 million underground. In other words, the suffering and the persecution and the resemblance to the cross brought new Christians out of martyrs' blood. Well, in the end, I was expelled. They didn't want foreigners in China, and they kicked us all out. Told me they were going to execute me, but they don't want to execute a man. It makes a mess, and the papers would not be favorable. So I was sent out, and I came back to Ireland, and I was... The hierarchies of England and Ireland invited me to go to England for the Irish emigration in 1955. When I told them I knew nothing about the Irish, they said, we, the hierarchies of Ireland and England, have decided that the Legion of Mary is the answer. I said, all right, I will work through it, and it was very successful. Then I was asked to go to the United States and Canada. I spent 12 years there, and I say here that it is, it is far, far better in the United States than anyone thinks of. After that, I was asked to go back to the Far East by Mr. Duff. I went to Japan and Korea, and Taiwan and Hong Kong, visiting the bishops. And then Mr. Duff asked me to go to the Philippines. I said, why the Philippines? They're a Catholic country, 60 million Catholics, and the Legion of Mary is very strong there. He said, I want you to go because they are the only Catholic nation in the Far East. And if the Far East is ever to be converted, it must be through the Filipino lay people. That was 1980. Now, in 1990, all the bishops of the Far East are saying the same thing. There are 150,000 Filipinos in Hong Kong. You have 25,000 in Taiwan. They go because of their economic condition, just to get a few dollars to send back to their parents. They're nearly all university graduates, and yet they're babysitting, sweeping the floors, working in restaurants. They won't give them other jobs, but the money is good. The problem now is to have enough chaplains for the Filipinos in all these countries. They're in every country in the world, even in Norway and Sweden. And in Rome, the priests are delighted that the churches which they were going to close are now too small for the Filipino congregation. The Filipinos who love the Blessed Eucharist will go anywhere to get a Mass. The Filipinos who love the Blessed Mother and know that that is the great means of getting to her son. Mr. Duff asked me to go there to send, to do some particular work, and it was this, to give, to introduce the Incola Mariae program. Incola means a sojourner. 
and the late Father Bradshaw, who finished up in a parish in Siberia, died there partly from starvation, but left a magnificent parish behind him in Siberia. He was in Iceland for 16 years. He came from the college in Thurles, and he had 64 inculae. What are they? Legionaries from Dublin, London, England, America, who gave up their jobs there and went to these countries and took a job of sweeping the floor, washing Coca-Cola bottles, enough to eat, and spending all their free time on knocking on doors and trying to tell people about Jesus and Mary. I was asked to repeat this in the Philippines. Did it succeed? Cardinal Sin was delighted. All the bishops were delighted, and they said, you will get results from the Philippines. Philippines, where things are so difficult. We now have had 35 in Cole Maria. Where do they go? Papua New Guinea, Brunei, Malaysia, Fiji Islands, Gilbert Islands, where nobody knows where it is, Western Samoa, who won the Seven Aside Rugby Cup, American Samoa, and what do they do there? They take a job and they give five evenings a week to apostolic work. Do they bring a lot of money back home? Not at all. The money they get is very small, but they come back thrilled at the fact that they gave two years, three years, anything up to seven years of sharing their youth and their faith with others of these countries. That is what I am doing at the moment. But it does take me to these islands, and it does take me to the countries. And I went, I flew seven hours over the Pacific Ocean from Fiji to the Gilbert Islands, once belonging to England. When I got there, after seven hours flying, it was hardly a place for the aeroplane to land. And I got there and I found, to my amazement, the Legion of Mary so strong I could hardly believe it. There was a comitium there, one comitium with 25 courier, and each courier with 20 presidia of 10 to 20 members. They took care of the islands around them, and they took care of Christmas Island, 2,600 miles away. The priest? No. Lay people, ordinary boys and girls, men and women, that the priest and the sister would have enough had enough insight to see that they could not work without them. There are great numbers of priests, sisters, and brothers who have loved the Legion of Mary throughout the world and have used it well. But at the same time, the numbers are miserable. When you think of the vast number of these possible spiritual directors that there are. Very often the seminaries know nothing about it. I did say that I came through college, but at that time we didn't know much about the lay people. Now it is a common subject. Now it is Vatican II that is pushing it. My mother used to say at that time when Frank Duff started, what is he doing telling us lay people to do something? She brought me up to say, leave it to the priest. Leave it to the sister. What do you know about it? She was right. I knew nothing. But Mr. Duff came along and introduced the fact that by your very baptism you are bound to be apostolic. You have no right whatsoever to keep your faith to yourself. Now, as I say, we have wonderful seminaries with wonderful examples. One is in Naga, in the Diocese of Bicolandia in the Philippines. In their theologate, they have 90 students and they have 22 presidia of the Legion of Mary. They meet every week. They report on the work that they are doing outside in teaching and so on. And they discuss their problems and they have their own courier. And when the priests are ordained, they are splendid. Now, unfortunately, in other places, when they're ordained, they have had no exposure to the Legion of Mary. And therefore, they have to learn it gradually. After my own experience, I cannot see how a priest or sister or brother or religious of any kind could be without the Legion of Mary or some very efficient form of Catholic action which would enable the lay people to help them. I have 
constantly spoken to priests' conferences, and I'm afraid that very often they do not have a very clear picture of what the Legion of Mary is. Often I get the question that it is, or the idea that it is far too Marian, and that all the prayers are addressed to Mary. Well, of course, that is not true. If we go to the trouble to read carefully the little prayer card which is read by every auxiliary and by every active member every day of their lives, you find that the first prayer is addressed to the Holy Spirit. The second prayer is the Rosary. And Cardinal Sunand, not so long ago, suggested to me that the Rosary was one of the finest prayers to the Holy Spirit. And when I asked him why he thought that, he said, well, after all, if we're meditating on the mysteries as we're supposed to do, it is recalling all the chief interventions of the Holy Spirit in the scheme of redemption. And I said, Eminence, where did you get that idea? He said, as a matter of fact, Father, I got it in the handbook of the Legion of Mary. First spoken of by Mr. Frank Duff down in the Columban Sisters in Caracon in 1923. He had that idea of the Holy Spirit in his mind that Mary, without her spouse, the Holy Spirit, would be ineffective. So the prayers are addressed to our Blessed Lady. The handbook is not blue. It is red in honor of its patron. The vexillum, which stands on the table, is topped by the Holy Spirit and Mary in her proper perspective. Finally, Father Tor, the first spiritual director of the Legion of Mary in Dublin, when he was dying in 1954, he let me in on the secret, and I was so glad I heard it, that in 1928 at the Concilium meeting in Dublin, when many priests were present and helping the Legion, Mr. Duff asked them to write something that would be good for a consecration, an act of consecration for legionaries after three months. <clears throat> the priests were asked to write something and they said they would. And they said, well, Mr. Duff, I think you should write something too. And he said he would. And Father Tor said after the meeting he took a train down to Mount Melry and spent the week in the front of the tabernacle in the chapel. And when the next month came for the concilium meeting, he asked the priests to read their different efforts, and we would select which was the most suitable for a promise. And they said, Mr. Duff, you are the only layman, you read first, please. And Mr. Duff read, Most Holy Spirit. I, desiring this day to be enrolled as a legionary of Mary, Yet knowing that of myself I cannot render worthy service to ask of thee to come upon me and fill me with thyself. And Father Tor began to laugh in the bed. I said, Father, what are you laughing at? He said, we all put our hands in our pockets, took out our paper and tore it up. We had all addressed the promise to the Blessed Mother so that Mr. Duff's vision of God's scheme of redemption was much clearer. Therefore, when I am traveling about, my main effort is everywhere to try and get priests to understand, and sisters, that it will multiply their work. Today I might suggest that where sisters are doing so much work in the parishes, not so much in the convent as in the parish, going from door to door and meeting the people and doing what is necessary to the children and so on, that they could multiply themselves hundreds of times if they went to the trouble to form groups of men, women, young people, and act as spiritual directors, as well as doing their own work from door to door. 
this is so evident today, so obvious that that multiplication is necessary. We will never have enough priests, we will never have enough sisters. And now, with the shortage of our vocations, we have to think in these terms. As a matter of fact, it is quite frightening to think of the situation of vocations, although God's arm is never shortened by circumstances. As far as I can see, the vocations are going to come from the countries that have suffered for the last 50 years. The Philippines, South Korea, which went through terrible wars, Vietnam, that suffered under the communists, and China. We now see that things are getting quite exciting in China. And I believe we will have Chinese priests coming out to help us in our parishes at home. South Korea, when we went there, the Columban Fathers, there were 100,000 Catholics. Today, you have three and a half million. And Cardinal Kim, the Cardinal of Seoul, would give great credit to the 260,000 active members of the Legion of Mary in Korea that have spent their lives knocking on doors, coaxing, persuading, bringing them to the catechists, getting them instructed, and then the priest baptizing them and saying, you know very little, but get into that group and practice what you do know on the people who know nothing. I would hope that this devotion to Jesus through Mary would increase and multiply, bring us closer to Christ himself, and add to the evangelization of the world.